The Langberg Finds, Remnants of the Lost 15th Century Tailoring Revolution. This paper was presented by Rachel Case, Marion McNeely, and Beatrix Nutz at the 2017 NISAT Conference at Liberec, Czech Republic, on the 24th of May, 2017. The Langberg Castle and the Extant Textile Garments, presented by Beatrix Nutz, narrated by Marion McNeely. In 2008 at the Castle Langberg, located in East Tyrol, Austria, archaeological investigations of several parts of the building were carried out under the direction of Harold Stadler of the Institute of Archaeology's University of Innsbruck. During the research, a filled vault spandrel was detected in the south wing of the castle in room 207 on the second floor. The backfill was taken out by workers of a local construction company and stored for subsequent sieving, which took place in summer 2009. The fill consisted of dry material in different layers, among them organic material such as twigs and straw, but also worked wood, leather, mainly shoes, and textiles. The finds have been radiocarbon dated to the second half of the 15th century. The textile finds consist of over 2,000 fragments, as well as a few almost completely preserved pieces of underwear, dresses, shirts, hose, etc. Among them was a nearly complete linen bra and several linen dress linings, which are the focus of this presentation. Here is one of the most famous of the finds from Langberg, the oldest bra in the world. This has been reconstructed by my colleague Mrs. Rachel Case as a skirted bra, as seen here worn by the potter in the playing card, who is also wearing a similar garment, although no cups can be seen. This is a linen lining of the woman's gown, and you can still see a bit of the outer layer of blue wool that is left on it. The wool fabric was woven, fulled, and teased, as proven by remains of the nap. Enough of the garment has been preserved to attempt a reconstruction. On the right of the screen you can see an etching from 1460 to 1465 of a woman wearing a similar gown. This is another linen lining, the back and half of the front of a gown for a small four-year-old girl, with a fragmentary woolen outer layer of a slightly different shade of blue than the woman's gown. There is a painting, most likely by the Master of Utenheim, dated 1470 to 1480 of the birth of the Virgin Mary, which is on display in Prague at the Sternberg Palace Museum. It shows the same type of back construction. And now Mrs. Rachel Case on the medieval fashionable ideal and the underwear and its reconstruction. Gilbert of Howland, 12th century abbot of Swineshead Abbey, wrote this sermon, which reads in part, And if you want to hear something spiritual, which expresses beauty, then I advise you to study the women who take care of their body in attire and who obtain some workmanship in it. Because what do they strive more to do in decorating their chests, as that their breasts are not oversized, ugly, and cover a portion of the breast itself? Therefore they bind oversized and hanging breasts together with breastbands so as to cure an error of nature through their artistry. For only those breasts are beautiful that protrude just a little and are moderately plump, that are not too prominent, but are not the at the same level with the rest of the flesh, as it were the breasts that are compact, but not flat, who are a little restrained and do not hang immoderately. Prior to the finds at Langberg Castle, no other supportive garments with separate cups for the breasts have been found that date back to the 15th century. Several manuscripts dating from the mid to late 15th century depict women wearing supportive undergowns. Although these garments have attached skirts and the Langberg bra with cups does not, it is my assertion that it originally did. I will talk more about that later when I discuss the reconstructions. Many of these manuscripts also show a particular gown style, which features pleats in the front just under the bust and in the back just above the waist. The constructions of these gowns requires the wearer to support the breasts in an underlayer. The presence of the skirted bra in the Langberg finds, along with extant gown of this pleated type, supports the idea that the underlayer consisted of a supportive garment. Without this supportive layer, the profile of the breasts would change and would not appear as separate lifted breasts, which I have come to call apple breasts. Although the extant garment is only partially preserved, one would not necessarily conclude that it was originally skirted. But the presence of depictions of skirted undergarments in the visual record 
points to the very plausible idea that this garment originally had attached skirts, which were probably ripped off at some point in order to reuse the fabric. Through my experiments in making and wearing my own Langberg-style bras, I learned that without attached skirts, the garment rides up and bunches up underneath the breasts. This problem is solved with the addition of attached skirts, with the weight of the skirts keeping the body of the bra in place. The skirts on the reconstruction are meant to fall at mid-calf on a woman of approximately 155 centimeters, that's 5 foot 1 inches, based on historical height average of women in the Middle Ages. The person who wore this garment was either a very slim adult woman or a teenager. The cups are not quite symmetrical. The outer cup halves have a slightly steeper curve, which may have counteracted the east-westing phenomenon, in which the breasts would have tended to face away from each other. The linen in the cups is of a slightly finer weave than the rest of the garment. There is also an indication that there was a center seam in the ribcage area of the front of the skirted bra. The space between the cups of the extant bra now has only fragments of needle lace remaining, but probably originally held a sprang inset connected to finger loop braids with simple needle lace to help it lie flat. Otherwise, the top would have gaped open. Also sewn here is the hem of the extant bra, showing a double linen thread with holes indicating that stitching was done along that edge. This points toward the presence of attached skirts. Although the extant garment is missing its right side, the reconstruction is made to lace up both sides to accommodate weight gain or loss. Lacing along one side would misalign the garment if one gained weight and the lacing needed to be loosened. This is from my own experience. The female garments, their bias properties, and reconstruction presented and narrated by Marion McNeely. The fashion period that the Langberg dress remnants are from is a rare period in the historical record. The fashionable ideal of having the breast be visible as two separate defined mounds on the outer clothing layer is actually quite rare in history, even though this idea is currently in fashion, especially in evening wear. From 1500 to 1800 in Europe, the breasts were supported as a pair, not separately, by the undergarments. The most commonly seen look post-1800 and the one seen in the current day is to have the breasts bifurcated in the undergarments but be seen as one curving mound in the outer clothing layer, as seen in the photos of the corset and portrait both dated 1885. The reason that this is so is because it's actually quite difficult to get cloth to dip between the breasts to create the definition. The fabric naturally wants to continue in a straight line between the two breast points. In order to accomplish this dip, the techniques used to create the Langberg garments are a bit different and rely heavily on the use of the bias in order to get the fabric to curve between the breasts. The woman's gown has a panel set on bias point into a shoulder piece with a very clever side dart which curves the fabric over the side of the breast. The grain of the fabric runs straight down between the breasts providing for the fashionable defined look. These gowns are a masterpiece of working with the grain of the fabric to stretch it and shape it to get the results wanted. There are three different ways that they created the pleats, all of them using the collapse of the bias grain in different ways. As the grain of the fabric rotates the bias, the threads do not remain square, but collapse into a diamond shape. The tailors use this in various ways to create the pleats, using different methods in each place on the gowns. The garment remnants found at Langberg also offer a unique view into the tailoring techniques used at the time, which are unexpected since similar techniques are not found in later 16th century women's wear. For both of the gowns, the linen lining is the foundational structure that the garment is built on, the wool is just a pretty veneer over the top. On the woman's gown, there are tiny wool fragments left, which show that the wool was laid over the top of the linen and pad stitched in place. There is a small section of wool remaining which extends over the top of the linen seam, without an indication of a corresponding seam in the wool, thus showing that the wool was whole and not seamed as the linen was. Having the wool be in one piece for the front, would have put the wool fabric grain on the stretchy bias at the shoulder, but with the wool being secured to the linen, the linen became the supportive structure underneath it, preventing the wool from stretching out of shape. 
Of course the linen has a curved 3D shape, especially on the front of the woman's gown, but with the bowl pad stitched into place over the curved section and the grate on the bias over the shoulder section, the wool can be easily steamed with a damp pressed cloth and hot iron and shrinked and stretched into the same shape as linen. The back of the girl's gown is the only surviving known remnant of this type of pleated gown, and it was quite the puzzle. It looks deceptively simple until one begins to examine the grain lines and figure out the shape of the armhole. As in the front, the shoulder seam is on the straight of grain. In fact, the deep V of the back shoulder straps are also on the straight of grain. But the short center back seam right below appears to be on the simple 45 degree bias grain, but in fact is a complex curve as seen in the offcut found at Langberg of a woman's gown back neck. This complex curve allows the straps to be angled at 45 to 50 degrees and then swoops down to ease out most of the angle into the center back. Without this complex curve, the junction between the center back seam and the straight grain section for the pleats is too sharp and the fabric will poke out in an unsightly manner. Even with the curve, this is still a slight problem, but it's easily resolved by steaming the wool well, stretching it and pounding it flat as it cools. The wool and linen both flatten out during this process and it also begins to open up the armholes. The pad stitching is also an essential part of the design of the back, stabilizing the area around the pleats, flattening it out and also helping to frame and define the pleats. Without the rows of stitching, the pleats will not stay defined well. The armholes themselves are cut very small, which is quite amazing considering how large they end up being on the finished gown. But this particular shape allows the fullness of the extra fabric created by the opening up of the armholes to flow into the center back and gives the fullness needed for the pleats. If the armholes had been cut as large as they appear to be, not only would there not be enough fabric for the center back pleats, but they also would have stretched out of shape quite easily. The front section of the lining is pieced in several places on both the woman and the girl's gowns so that the shoulder section and the seam is on the straight grain. This is so the neckline does not stretch out from the weight of the gown. The reconstructed girl's gown weighs about 4 kilos, which is about 8 to 9 pounds, mainly due to the heavy weight of the linen lining, which matches the original fabric weight and weave. The woman's gown used a much lighter weight linen for the lining, otherwise the finished gown would have been too heavy. This leads to an interesting finding that these dresses are impossible to recreate without the use of an iron to manipulate the wool by stretching and shrinking. The use of the iron is especially important in the shaping of the back because without the iron, the shape is impossible to achieve. Before this, there had been irons found in digs and seen in artwork depictions of tailors but no actual indications that tailors at this time were using them to manipulate the shape of the fabric as later 19th century tailors did. In conclusion, these rare garment finds give us a unique view into the tailoring techniques which were lost with a change in women's fashion at the end of the 15th century. The impressive use of the bias grain, darts, pad stitching, and ironwork to shape the garment were unexpected in a garment this early and are the earliest dating of such techniques. The study and reconstruction of these garments have enabled us to answer many long-standing questions about the layers involved in this period to achieve the fashionable ideal of this era, which has perplexed people for decades. The support achieved by the skirted bra allows for a gown which skims the body and is not supportive of the bust at all. This support by an undergarment was commented on by an earlier period poet. A Ballad on Women Who Bundle Up Their Breasts by Eustace de Champs Ever since the breast displayed itself in every place quite generally, the desire has entered many minds to come covertly and ravish it, because it gives itself so suddenly, heart pangs to many just by seeing it, and it has found people who were so cruel they took it prisoner and tortured it. In Paris it is in a piteous state. Lady, take pity on the breast. What got it into this predicament is only the result of youth. Round, small, and firm, it didn't then display itself so openly, but then it foolishly let go, turned flabby, heavy, unattractive, and so it was divided into two, sewn into bags across the bosom, and bound up with all sorts of cords and knots. Lady, take pity on the breast. Surely it will die if in this plight. It's trussed up far too tightly now. It would be good indeed to deliver it, and give it at least some relief, because it suffers in such tormenting pain, for having been of such a gracious shape, 
these women who are lovers and those men who understand the ways of love bring succor to this victim who is languishing lady take pity on the breast princes if someone doesn't help it is possible it will leap out since prison is sapping all its strength or else it will break all its bonds and then fall straight into a ditch lady take pity on the breast